scheduling this visit and taking the time out of, out of your uh, day to talk with us. Uh, we're going to turn the whole show over to you in a moment, but before we get started, why don't we just go around the room once again so that everyone knows uh, who's here. Uh, again, my name is Mark Jones. I'm the editorial page editor. Dave Jolly, I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs. Thanks, again. Wendy Wilson, Vice President of Public Relations and Marketing at the Medical Center. And Andrew Cedars, yeah. Bob Stegmeyer, President and CEO of the Community Medical Center. Glad to see you guys here. Prashant Chitra, President. Joe Blackwoods, Executive Editor. Gerard Hetman, Online and Digital Media. Uh, obviously, our conversation is recorded today, if that's okay with you. Sure. Uh, all or parts of it are probably going to appear on our website at some point. <laughs> and <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> And uh, like I say, uh, why don't we turn it over to you and, and get started there. And if it's all right, we'll jump in when we have questions. Sure. I mean, we, we don't have prepared remarks, but um, I think the reason that we're coming to you today is to talk about the, uh, the rationale, both uh, strategic as well as, as uh, some of the tactical stuff for uh, our, our next uh, Geisinger uh, commitment to the Northeast. transacted uh, here in Wilkesbury uh, and think we're bringing value to uh, the folks in Luzerne County almost, what, three and a half years or so or four years after the purchase of what then was Mercy Wilkesbury. Right. And um, we could go over the particulars in terms of uh, increased uh, services and capital expenses and what have you. Uh, the strategy, however, to build GWB as, as almost a smaller version of the GMC model so that people don't have to leave the area uh, in order to get really complex uh, care. They don't have to go to Philadelphia or New York. In fact, they don't have to go, in most cases, even to Danville, but they can stay here. And then to redevelop the, uh, the South Wilkesbury campus as a state-of-the-art ambulatory campus, and we can decant an awful lot of stuff that used to be done as an inpatient to an outpatient campus. Um, one of the things that you <clears throat> may not be aware of, but overall, 51% of, uh, of our intervention revenue now is ambulatory or outpatient. So we've swung from most of that revenue being inpatient to most of it being outpatient. And we think that that switch from inpatient to outpatient will continue uh, to go on over the next five to 10 years, even though we're building up a lot more program for a high intensity innovation, like for instance in neurosciences, like for instance in transplant, like for instance in level two trauma. So we feel really comfortable with what's happening here. It took us about two and a half, three years to you know move through a lot of the changes. They're not they were not easy changes, obviously, uh, either in terms of human beings or in terms of, of, um, of operations, but we we got through them and uh, so now we think it's time for the major uh, advance in the Northeast. We've had numerous conversations uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the entities up in, in, uh, in Scranton. Uh, we, this is our second conversation with CMC, and, and we're you know, delighted that we have a, an agreement for CMC to become a part of the Geisinger family. We, we, uh, we think that it's an expansion of our ability to give great services in the Northeast. We think it's a separate market, and I'm sure there'll be more detailed questions about that uh, in a minute. Uh, we think it's a real expansion of our brand, and I think as people particularly come out of Interstate uh, 84 or Interstate up Interstate 80, they're looking not only for good docs, but they're looking for the comfort of a brand when they uh, think about uh, either primary care or particularly when they think about specialty care. And we think we've got a great starting point with CMC. Uh, we feel good about its tradition. We feel good about its market share. Uh, we feel moderately good uh, about its uh, uh, its uh, capital infusion <clears throat> over the last few years. And we aim to actually feel good about that over the next few years. <laughs> uh, part of the deal. Um, and, uh, and 
know, mainly we feel good about its governance and we feel good about its leadership. The, the big difference between our ability to do the deal this time and not being able to do the deal last time was, uh, was two things. Number one, we didn't have Bob Stegmaier there as a CEO. And Bob has done a, a remarkable job uh, in, in doing a lot of the sociologic stuff that has to be done in order to feel comfortable about getting to a deal. And then the governance um, model this time was very straightforward so that when we got down to the nitty gritty in the, uh, in, in the uh, discussions, much more straightforward governance. They will become a part of the Geisinger Health System Foundation. And two members of their board, their chairman, uh, Jeff Jacobson, uh, and their vice chairman, Virginia McGregor, will become part of the Geisinger Health System Foundation big board uh, after we get through the regulatory process. So Bob, let, me, uh, let me have you give some comments, then we can open up for questions. Sure. Well, I stepped into a 114-year tradition of healthcare in Scranton at Community Medical Center a little over a year ago when I arrived. And as I got here, we immediately began to do some strategic planning to sort out the future as everyone on our my board at Community Medical Center was focused on what next, where do we go from here. Nobody had the interest in maintaining the status quo. Most of us saw the concerns with where we were in terms of access to capital and other things. And I would share the word that Glenn used, delighted. But because we are absolutely, thoroughly delighted to be, to have inked an arrangement to join the Geisinger system. You know, having uh, having uh, an organization of the caliber of Geisinger as a fellow not-for-profit Pennsylvania corporation is wonderful. But when you look at uh, what they've achieved in just the last decade, it is really, uh, phenomenal. And we uh, at Community Medical Center have, haven't have had the ability to invest in, in uh, programs and technology like we would have wanted to. But we've watched our fellow Pennsylvania nonprofit do it very, very well on, on every level. So uh, we, as when it came right down to it, looking at all alternatives in a strategic planning process, Geyser was at the top of the entire conversation. And we are excited for what we can bring to the north, uh, northeast Pennsylvania. And uh, in particular, the deployment of new information technology and the bringing together of focus on population health will be critical. I've never been in an environment where you don't bring together comprehensive electronic medical records with the best of evidence-based medicine and healthcare and not reduce variation and improve outcome and maximize value of the patients of northeast Pennsylvania that is there to be had and that's what we're going to do. So we are delighted to be at this stage. Okay. Um, you alluded to this earlier and, and uh, often on the editorial page we talk about regionalization and considering Scranton Wilkes Barre Hazleton in one area, but for your purposes you feel like these are two different populations and, and the folks from Scranton weren't necessarily going to make that trip to Wilkes Barre for the Geisinger brand name. Take us through some of the logic in terms of expanding. <clears throat> well, it's taken, taken me 11 years to understand uh, that uh, not only are the markets different, but the cultures are different. Uh, and, um, and we truly believe that, uh, and we said this before to you, that moving from three hospitals, uh, all uh, in, in, in a significant amount of operational stress in Luzerne County to two, uh, with really good capitalization, and fundamentally different business models with CHS on the one side, um, you know, run very well, but with a different business model than we have. Guys here on the other side, they have access to a good deal of capital because of their market, their market access as a for-profit. We have a good deal of access to capital because we've got a great balance sheet and it's gotten better over the last 10 or 11 years. So we, we thought, and I think it's proving, that these two systems can actually bring um, a significant amount of new product, new uh, uh, facility, uh, and a different uh, approach. Ours being more based on population health, theirs being much more hospital-centric. They'll give us a run for our money in terms of the efficiency of, of, of the hospital care, and that's good. It's always good to have a strong competitor. 
quite frankly. So, but we are interested just as much in keeping patients out of the hospital as we are giving great care to them if they have to go in. And the reason for that isn't that we're smarter or, you know, we're, you know, we, 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 you know we've got, uh, you know, some a better, you know, a, a better shtick. The reason is we've got an insurance company as a part of, as a part of, of our fiduciary. So if we do the right thing for people and keep them out of the hospital, we not only do good for the people, but we do well in terms of our business model. Because the total cost of care goes down, and that is a benefit to our insurance company. And because of our fiduciary, we can do the internal transfer pricing without having to do the negotiation across the table. And, and that's, that's really a huge benefit. And just to close the loop in terms of Scranton, we, th we think that three very difficult operating challenges from Moses and what used to be uh, Mercy Scranton and CMC going to two uh, will allow those two remaining uh, to do quite well. And we think it's good for the community. I mean, you know, it's interesting. The balancing act is to have enough competition not too much. If you have too much, everybody kills everybody else. If you have too little, you become a monopoly and you can do bad things. So I, th I think it's just right for two. Plus, with CHS as our main competitor again, it's a very clear-cut difference in business models. You mentioned uh, you are also an insurance provider. <coughs> there are folks who are argue that uh, you being healthcare provider and insurance provider at the same time uh, is or could be a conflict of interest or, um, or the customers or patients in this case may not get the right treatment uh, or because we're trying to make it cost efficient on one or the other side. What's your reaction to that? Well, the proof of the pudding is in what we've been doing and what we've become known for for the last 11 years nationally. Uh, so what we found is that there has to be a fundamentally different relationship between payer and provider, both focusing on benefiting the humans that are the highest cost, highest utilizing group. We found in most cases that those humans are not only high cost but lowest quality. So high cost and lowest quality in terms of mortality, morbidity, rehospitalizations, what have you, usually go together. And if you work together to re-engineer the care for those patients with three or four or five chronic diseases, both on the payer side as well as the provider side, two things happen. You extract a significant amount of the cost because a lot of that cost is um, duplication of effort, is fragmentation of care, is unjustified variation, is, um, it, it, can, it, it doesn't bring any value to, you know, Aunt Mary, who's 75 or 80, who, you know, is gaining 10 pounds of weight on a Friday, and she gets short of breath, and in most cases, she has to go to an emergency room and see somebody she's never seen before, and she gets admitted for a tuna. Now, that happens to Aunt Mary every 30 to 90 days. That's how the cost is driven up by 20% of the patients that we see. We know who those patients are on the insurance side. But what happens in our system is we can take that information and target a different kind of care on the provider side. That's why we've become well known nationally. Now we haven't quite penetrated yet the consciousness of the Northeast of Pennsylvania, but we're getting there. Well, We're getting there. It's a harder, it's a harder challenge than actually making us known nationally. Um, and and and, I, and that often happens in, in places where you have local, you have you have some local immutability, but you become known nationally. But we're working on it. So now the other the other interesting thing, and you're absolutely right. If if we were bad guys, and we had insurance, and we had provider working together, you can do bad things. And con so conceptually, your argument is right. So the proof is really in the doing and what we've actually accomplished. And the fact that because our insurance company is smaller than, uh, than even Northeast, if you look at RBC, we're a reserve-based capital, certainly smaller than Highmark, smaller than uh, Capital Blue Cross, 
in order for us to be competitive in the market when we're selling to you guys, when we're selling to the other small businesses, we, we've, we've got to have a reasonable bid in our premium price. And the only way we can do that is by re-engineering the care. It, it isn't by just you know, taking money from the balance sheet and getting into a price war. And what we found, and, and this was part of my religion, but I think we've proven it, what we found that is that it's not a choice between quality and cost reduction. For most of our re-engineering, you're basically extracting crap that doesn't help human beings, and you're increasing uh, the probability of a high quality output, keeping Aunt Mary out of the emergency room. And, and that is all built into our advanced medical. Now, one, one last thing. I'll be finished with this again. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in. <laughs> one, one last thing. Some of the people who will claim that there's an intrinsic conflict because of our, are probably the same folks who tried to actually figure out a way to own providers, is my guess. It may be overly cynical on my part, but that would be my guess. I. There's, there's no way Glenn can um, understate or state that the, the duplication, the waste, the variation in care that happens in healthcare in America today. It's amazing. It's actually, for those of you that don't live and breathe the healthcare system, for 20 years, I've, I've been amazed at how much waste there is in the system. And the difference now is over the last 15 years, we've begun to get a sense of what quality means and how to document it and hold ourselves accountable for it. So having a payer, but more importantly, having those quality metrics out in front and say, what are we doing to advance the bar? Here's how we perform. How do we get to this level? Has everything to do with bringing together comprehensive medical records, electronic medical records that are peripatetic, always there, instantly there. With the best of evidence-based medicine. Now, Geisinger has a term, proven care. What are they doing? They're reducing variation, improving outcome by constantly looking at what works, gleaning from the industry overall nationally, gleaning from their system of providers, and narrowing variation, improving outcome, and always reducing cost. That is the model for future of healthcare in this country. There's tremendous opportunity. We don't recoil with reform. We get excited about it. The industry needs to deploy information technology exactly as it's been deployed here at Geisinger. So uh, I think that point can't be under, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very critical point. And it goes to the core of the business. Part of the, part of the interesting part, part of the interesting expansion of our attempt to do value re-engineering of care and pull out a lot of the stuff that doesn't benefit humans <clears throat> is that when we move to CMC, 100% of the volume there is going to be non-Geisinger, non-employed position volume. <clears throat> and we don't see that changing in the near future. And, and, you know, everybody is now feeling pretty comfortable that our, um, <clears throat> you know, that our ability to extract unnecessary stuff, bad stuff that doesn't help humans, is doable in our unique system with employed physicians. And where we're both employing, you know, and where we're both providing care and ensuring the same patients. A legitimate question is how much of that is scalable and generalizable to other much more complex markets? Um, because obviously most of America doesn't get its care from systems that are as integrated as Geisinger. And, and moving up to CMC where you've got a lot of very well-trained uh, men and women uh, who are in private practice either doing hospital-based care or doing you know, the referral it's going to be a different, it'll be different for us. It'll be different. And that's a very interesting and intentional challenge that we're setting for ourselves. Why did you use the word invention? Because we've thought about it. <clears throat> and we want, you know, we want to show, I mean, a number of us are still at Geisinger because we'd like to see if what we've accomplished in that unique structure, in that unique market, is in fact capable of influencing a much bigger part of American healthcare. And Scranton is, you know, Scranton has got great docs, it's very fragmented, uh, it, it has practiced solely based on fee for service, which means every unit of work you do you get a reimbursement for, 
And you know, 30% of our business is paid for in this sweet spot between providing and insuring the same patients and something other than fee for service. So it'll be interesting as we bring that up uh, to a different, uh, a different uh, uh, a group of uh, physicians, all of whom are good, but have been conditioned for their entire career to do more and more units of work. It's going to be interesting to see how that turns out. It will not be easy, but it'll be fun. Your model is certainly unique. Do you believe, Here. Do, you believe yeah. uh, do, you th do you believe that's going to be the national healthcare model ultimately? <laughs> uh, uh, 20 years? No, about five to seven years. I would say 20 years, yes. I would say five to 10, it's going to be very heterogeneous. There's going to, still going to be a lot of people getting paid fee for service. I mean, the problem is, look, if, if the super committee in Washington decides that they have to whack Medicare, um, if they whack it by staying with fee-for-service and they just really cut down on the reimbursement, uh, it, it's going to be impossible. It will be impossible. And I think there'll be pushback. And I think the pushback will be access. People will say, well, we're not going to, we just don't have the capacity to take care of Medicare patients. These are people in small practices. And then the politicians will realize they've got to do something. So what else are they going to do? My guess is that the next thing they'll do is population budgeting. And it'll smell like, and it'll look like, and it'll feel like capitation. They won't call it capitation. They'll call it something else. So I think the men and women out there who are even in small practices are going to have to get used to it over the next few years because of the budget crisis in Washington, some radical changes. And we want to help them. But it's going to be very messy and very difficult over a few years. 20 years from now, I would guess, from the kind of people that we're dealing with coming out of medical school, both allopathic and osteopathic, I think more of them are going to want to join larger practices uh, for quality of life issues, not, not, just, you know, not just because of the reimbursement changes. But also the care model. I mean, as they come out of school today, they're looking for the state-of-the-art information technology. They're looking for all the tools that will allow that practitioner on his or her worst day to be in a great system to provide the best care. And that's everything to do with the infrastructure. You know, our job, basically, is to ensure we bring to that care event, whether it's in a clinic, an ED, an OR, an ICU, anywhere else in the community, the best information to enable that provider to provide the best care. And, that, and that's really the central mission of what we do. Can you talk to us about the rolling out of that medical records system? And what people can expect when they can expect it? Oh boy. Um, you know, it's embarrassing when you ask me detailed questions. Just, uh, you know, have to, we have, here's what I can tell you. I won't tell you what I don't know. We have a commitment of slightly less than $157 million of capital going into CMC over seven years big time. And some of that is to make up for areas that have been undercapitalized for a number of years. It, you know, it's a good it's a good plant, it's clean, it's well run. So it's not, you know, it's not it's not, you know, some heavy duty retrieval effort. But the operating room uh, is anachronistic. The ICUs are anachronistic for the care that's being given there. If we if we plan to develop more high intensity, tertiary, and maybe even quaternary care, they're going to have to be redone. And then a huge commitment, um, and I don't know the exact number, but a significant amount uh, is putting the EPIC system in. We will use the EPIC system because it's part of our overall commitment throughout our system. It's a big deal, um, and, and it will represent a significant amount of that, of that uh, initial, uh, initial uh, capitalization. What we would like to do, I mean, ideally, conceptually, what you'd like to do is if we decide to, uh, let's say, do a neurosciences program uh, at CMC, if we decide to really build out general surgical subspecialties, if we decide to do um, a pediatrics uh, inflow, similar to what we did in South Wilton, uh, if we decide you would like to put in 
just the amount of uh, infrastructure that you need for that, but it's almost impossible to do that. So you really have to do infrastructure across the board for uh, for Epic uh, in order to do this program build out. So I think it's going to be a, a big deal early on. And and just so you know, 4.4 percent of our revenue on the provider side, not the insurance side, but the provider side is our run rate for the Epic spend now, so it's a big deal. And that benches out, it's, it's pretty much at the, at the high end of any benchmark for systems, so we really have to feel as if it's critical for us to accomplish what we accomplish. We're, you know, we've embarked on a planning process with our medical leadership, with Geisinger uh, leadership as well, by program. So one of the smartest things we did is when we put together our business relationship, we didn't do any clinical planning. We worked on what we need from the business relationship. And then we've now moved into a very structured clinical planning process by, by service, by area. And our, our physician leadership are gonna to come together with, with straw man plans for how we're gonna develop. And I think what we're gonna see uh, right away is how important that information technology rollout is to advance those programs. They're gonna to come together almost instantly. So uh, we've got a big information technology project in front of us. And uh, oftentimes, you know, I, I think maybe 30% of hospitals in America have achieved CPOE, computerized physician order entry, and electronic medical records. Um, and we, we haven't, we're in that other 70%. And many of them march uh, by step at a time, sort of little bangs to get to the big bang rollout. We're gonna challenge ourselves internally to figure out how we can get further faster. And having a platform, an organization that has deployed the Epic system and all of its uh, components will enable us, I think, to Yeah, the other thing that, again, just to emphasize the fact that we're not hospital-centric, although hospital caregiving and, and upgrading the, the programs and the facilities is a huge part of the 157 million. You know, part, part of what we'll move ahead undoubtedly first will be our community practice array in the population. And it won't just be our own employed community practitioners, it'll be the community practitioners that are now a part of the referral base uh, for CMC. I mean we've held up our we've held up our final planning for Rick Martin's uh, Lakes Grant rebuild. He's been in a he's got a great group of docs that are up in Lakes Grant in what looks to be a kind of a, a uh, mortuary Mm -hmm. And uh, I promise him, I mean, I've been promising him for, for 10 years that he's going to have a rebuild. And every time we're close to getting board approval for that, you know, we were having another discussion with, with an entity in Scrap. We've finally done it now. And, and we have a, we actually have the board approval for a significant slug of that $157 million for that rebuild. But we're... You know, we're relooking where should it be now that we have the arrangement that it's in the regulatory process. Where should that be? Should it be where we had originally planned it or should it be somewhere else? How does it how does it coordinate with Prime Ed, for instance? Or how does it coordinate with some of the other non geysinger uh, uh, practices that are important to CMC? So it, it's, it's part of the process. If, if the strategy, part of the strategy, has been to keep patients in northeastern Pennsylvania rather than going to uh, metropolitan areas elsewhere. And the strategy is to keep costs uh, low as possible as well. Do you foresee specialty areas between Wilkesbury and Scranton? Might, might patients in the future go to Wilkesbury for one particular? Yeah, we, you know, we have to, we have to be fairly sensitive to some of the fears uh, uh, that our brethren in Scranton and <clears throat> despite the fact that I've learned after 11 years that the cultures are different, you know, that there's this kind of genetic barrier uh, 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 and, and that in terms of travel either way, uh, there's still a fear that Geisinger is going to come in, you know, build GWV even bigger and turn CMC into an ambulatory or what have you. So what I've said initially <clears throat> is that we are going to focus on programs to build at CMC to make sure that there's proof of what you know what I said in principle, which is this will remain an extraordinarily active uh, tertiary care center. Uh, 
obviously, <clears throat> as we do a neonatal ICU down here, we're not going to do a neonatal ICU up there. Um, as we look at, <clears throat> at expanding OB here, the question is still uh, being looked at by Bob and the, and the program planning group. Should there be a change in what had been really a giving up of all OB uh, a number of years ago by CMC? That's a big deal. Do we do something else? So we're going to try not to be duplicative, except where it's obvious that in that market we need to build strong programs. So initially, there's a level two up there, Ramit. There's a level two here, GWB. Those level twos will be maintained. Now, whether there's some ability to do subspecialty recruitment in a way that you know allows us with to have more trauma neurosurgeons or trauma orthopedists or specialty folks that could function between the two. There may be ways of finessing it, but I just have to be very sensitive and, and Bob will guide me about not, you know, playing into the caricature or the fear, you know, that we're going to close it down because we're not. There, there was a time when people from here would go to Danville for certain levels of care. You mentioned earlier that GWB is almost level of, or you want to get the level of GMC, but it's, but these two markets, are, these two areas, we'll call them closer than, than going to Danville for right. Wadden Valley. Right. Well, I think the demography, I mean, Danville, <clears throat> I have to be careful that I don't offend either the folks in Danville or here, but, you know, Danville is always going to be the heart and soul of guys, that's where Abigail founded us, I mean, she's very looking at us. Uh, and, and, uh, and, it, and it's a really interesting place where we can do, you know, we've had a hundred years of integrated uh, system sociology, and that's a big deal. Uh, up here, it's a totally different market, totally different sociology, and, and yet, if you look at the demography of up here, it's pretty vital. I mean, if you look at Monroe, Pike, and Wayne, there is no reason that the folks who are going to continue to move out of the um, greater metropolitan area of New York and New Jersey should not find it more convenient and more efficient, both cost efficient as well as in terms of, 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 their, of their lifestyle, to come here for great care as opposed to going to New York City. Are you kidding me? Plus, we have better care. Uh, we have better care here in many ways, but we need a brand. And I think CHS coming here is a brand. It's a good brand, strong brand. And Geisinger is a good brand. And so I think, again, getting back to the fact that there have to be alternatives, there's got to be checks and balances, basically. You know, I, I, I feel good about it. I feel good about getting more of that business here. Because the demography already is very, very positive here. When I say here, bigger here than, than Luzerne or Lackawanna, it's a bigger here. Uh, did I read correctly that you anticipate uh, growth in the workforce, CMC? You bet. Five percent? Well, you know, uh, we'll pick up, how many FTEs do you have right now? About 1,400, a little over 1,400. 1,400. So if you look at the Geisinger numbers, we're at about, we're over somewhere between 1,400 and 1,500, 14,000 and 15,000 FTEs now. So as a Geisinger family, we'll be over 15,000 immediately. If, if this goes through regulatory and, and we actually come to a close. But if you look at, if you look, if you extrapolate what's happened at GWV and Geisinger over the last 10 years, year by year, to what we expect to do, um, and you kind of prorate the capital and program expansion plans, uh, we, we've gone from 7,000 FTEs a little over 10 years ago for the entire Geisinger family to somewhere between 14,000 and 15,000. And that's at a time when the overall non-agricultural employment in the Commonwealth has decreased by about a percent. Now that may change because of Marcellus uh, over the next uh, few years. I just, I don't know. So the overall may go up non-agricultural. But I suspect that we'll have the same growth pro rata at CMC and in this area uh, as we had simply due to program growth. Now the other thing is we plan for every dock, it takes four additional FTEs. So when we <laughs> expand our doctor group, it takes four people for back office billing and regulatory stuff and, and 
what have you. And so we have choices as to where to place a lot of that back office because it does not have to be on our caregiving campuses. And we've already put a huge amount of stuff up in Glenmar. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But we may very well, and we've got to expand again uh, for up here, we may very well put some of that back office stuff in the middle of Scranton. Because what we have to do is we have to show to the community that we're building jobs. We can do that very easily. Um, because we don't have quite the same proposition in, in terms of taxes as CHS does. So we have to build the job. We have to show that in a very concrete way. We plan to do that. Phil can help the note. We have space in Wilkes-Barre too. I don't know. <laughs> 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 just kidding. <laughs> Andrew, you have an aspect of it. If I'm hearing right, your goal is to not duplicate services between what you have planned at CMC and what you already have down here. It's not true. Uh, we'll have duplication. We will have duplicated uh, services, but in some uh, late tertiary and quaternary, we will we'll basically try not to, like neonatology, for instance. And we haven't made a decision about OB and uh, at the same time. Why is that? Why would you want to duplicate 12 miles away? Because it's a different market, uh, basically. You know, we think that people will, you know, for various reasons, as we said before, come to Wilkesbury for their care. I mean, people aren't going to leave Scranton to have heart surgery uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, GWB. What people will do is they'll go from CMC to what used to be Mercy Street. We don't want to lose that pool. Uh, basically, we want to expand. And, and you know, it's, a, it's an important part of any tertiary uh, facility. Now, if we were to do, if, if we were to do uh, a significant expansion in transplant, would we do it in both places? Probably not. So we have to pick and choose. We have to pick and choose. Yeah, it's more it's a more complex question, really, you know, from primary to quaternary care. And as you get up the chain to the more exquisite and complex care, you have to take that resource and manage it. Um, it's a scarce resource. So, you know, you can look at community hospitals and say there's a certain scope that represents a community hospital. And that scope is going to exist both up in Scranton and Community Medical Center and here. And then there are other things of how you build those higher levels of care and coordinate within a system to be efficient is what it's about. So we're you know we'll, we're having those di that dialogue, but absolutely there are some services that will be the same. I mean absolutely for sort of more uh, routine primary secondary and, and so well, that was too is a good example. I mean you know as I said we have to be sensitive to the fears of the folks up there. And if I walked up there and we shut down the level two and said, let's do it at GWB, that would confirm all their fears. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that, basically. So if it sounds like we're waffling, we're waffling. We're basically saying we're going to be rational. You know, we're, we're going to look at it as we, as we go along. But we are committed to having a, a you know, I, I want this facility to be, CMC facility to be, you know, the preeminent inpatient facility uh, in that market. What's the next market for you? you know, Expanding slowly? Bloomsburg. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I'm not joking. It's true. We well, were talking about you know the, the growth of Wayne and Pike in the rural counties. Um, and are you looking at purchasing Oklahoma Medical Center or Wayne Memorial or no and no. We have we have land in Honesdale. We've had land in Honesdale for oh boy five or six years, and um, it's about 15 acres that uh, that we picked because I was interested in you know one of the previous discussions we had with one of the entities in Scranton, thinking about reaching out with community practice, and a lot of what happens in Honesdale and a couple of those other you know, very high you know high demographic communities uh, around Interstate 84 relates more to Scranton than it does to Wilkesbury. Um, and so, you know, we put that on hold. We put it on hold for two reasons. Number one, 2008 happened financially and the markets went kaput. Uh, you know, I didn't want to stand up in front of my board and, and really you know, seem you know, undisciplined. But, but one of the things that we would think about there is, is actually to build out our community practice in Homestead. 
as a potential feeder to uh, to scram. Put a gas well on it. I'm sorry. You could put a gas well on it. <laughs> no, that would be diversification. Oh, I'm sorry. Double air um, We kind of danced around it, but from a business perspective, could you tell us when you're looking? You, you mentioned the culture is different between the communities, and that they are separate markets. Could you talk to us more about that? How you see it? I, no, I can't because I'm not of the area, and I think you have to be of the area to really. Really but in making your decisions, obviously, it's influenced. I do what people tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're all data driven, and we look at the data and we see where people seek their health care, and, and it pods up really nicely here in the, in the, in the northeast Pennsylvania. So it's it's kind of a no brainer that people seek would like to seek care close to home, want a strong hospital to seek care, and then want a system to tap into, an integrated system where they can seek the more exquisite, more complex care with proven outcomes. And so I think that's really what we're trying to do. Will there be, will there be any impact on the local customers from this good bed? The local electric basic hospitals, facilities here in Luzerne County? No. Not, they won't lose anything? No. Will they gain anything? I think they might. Uh, that's more speculative. Again, if we're if we're trying to if we're trying to expand the brand, the Geisinger brand, and, and we find that the brand is affirmed now almost equally on the insurance as well as the provider side. We used to have a lot of polarity between the two sides of the, of the house back in the day. I mean, they, one became the other. I mean, it was, it was interesting. But we we used that sweet spot with the thirty percent of care that we give and we insure to do a huge amount. Of both sides now value the other side dramatically. And of course, for 70% of our business, we're getting paid you know, by non guys So we're in the market in many, many ways. What we think is that brand increases and people are seeking a primary care, people who are you know, moving out into Wayne Pike and Rome. Uh, when they seek that care, they're going to go to a brand uh, more than likely. So hopefully by expanding our hub, which is really what we're doing by including CMC uh, next to GM, uh, GWB, uh, hopefully we'll get you know we'll get more of that business coming in from the folks who are first approaching us, uh, coming out of Interstate 80 or Interstate 84, looking for community practice, you know, looking for convenient care, or getting our insurance. Product. And our insurance product is actually going to be leaving the state as well for, for well for the second time. We had a brief foray with Guthrie in New York, and that, that was years ago before I came. But we'll be leaving the state with our insurance product, which is interesting. And we're thinking about getting that insurance product as a brand closer to the New York metropolitan area, so that when people come up 80, come up 84, again they will have an insurance product which allows them to go to either GWB or CMC. Very important part of strategic thinking. So where are you going to? New Jersey. And this is, you know, this is just planning, but we're also, we've already announced we've gone to West Virginia, uh, and we have some planning for other contiguous states as well. Not on the provider side. What's your outlook for uh, doctors in Northeastern Pennsylvania? Uh, we, do you we, have an uh, interaction with the Commonwealth Medical College? Well, let me, there's two questions. Number one, <clears throat> there's actually three questions. Number one, um, we've been able to recruit really well here. We've recruited overall very well. I mean, the last year, I think we recruited 120 docs net. Uh, that is after we had a turnover. Our turnover is about 4%, which is really good when you look at benchmarks. It's usually up around 10 or 11 for groups our size. We're about 1,000 employee positions now. Uh, the year before, we recruited 140 docs. Uh, over a third of those docs have been recruited to the Northeast. So it's a big deal. Uh, and, and we've been just as good recruiting PAs and nurses, and nurse practitioners, which is also a very important part of our re-engineering approach. Uh, about 
25% of our business at GWV is still non-Geisinger, so it's an open staff hospital. As I said, 100% of the business at CMC is non-Geisinger and will be for a period of time. So we're, we're getting pretty, you know, we're getting pretty comfortable with those guys and girls. Um, obviously a huge, I mean, they're all on the, I mean, they're almost all on the panel, the Geisinger Health Plan panel. Uh, so that's not a problem. And as we, as we end up getting a decision for them to either align with CHS or us, and with our approach, our business model being distinctly different, it gives them a choice as well. And, and uh, I think that's a good thing. And we value them, and we es essentially are going to compete for their business by trying to build better facility, trying to build better enabling technology. So our commitment, and our commitment is the same at State College, as we build out our facilities in State College, we are committed to open staff as well for our new facilities. So it's not like Kaiser, which is closed staff. It, it is, it's, a, it's a different type of approach. Because in the answer to your question earlier, I believe we're going to have a tremendous heterogeneity in the way we give care for the next five to ten years. But we still want to influence improvement in both the quality outcome as well as the cost. Uh, the Commonwealth Medical College, the second part of that question. I was actually, I, I just came from uh, speaking with uh, Dr. Nora, who's the interim dean up there. We are starting today, believe it or not, uh, a commitment which was uh, planned years ago to take six of their medical students for multi year longitudinal training uh, at uh, GWV and, and in our community practice here in Missouri. And uh, I'm, I heard from Linda Famiglio, who runs our, our academic. She's the kind of queen of all of our academic stuff uh, for education. Um, Linda said there's 16 of the 20 Luzerne County kids who are at the Commonwealth are competing for those six slots. So we've already got a pretty good start there. And, uh, and we're looking forward to that. What I was talking to Dr. Nora about was the possibilities of a more robust interaction with the Commonwealth as we move into this way. And that, you know, that's, that's under discussion. Andrew, do you have anything? A couple more. Um, you alluded earlier to the debt reduction committee, which I think is supposed to get down to business tomorrow. And I understand that uh, at least certain aspects of the medical community would like to see that group essentially fail so that the default plan would become the plan. Right, right. And, and uh, I think that's near-term thinking. And I understand it, and I, you know, I know the math, uh, and I think there's a good chance they will fail, and that's just my personal opinion. Um, but we still have an unresolved problem, which is the cost trajectory. And, um, and, and our religion uh, at Geisinger is, we think we have, at least within our structure, a significant um, solution to the problem by extracting 30 to 35 percent of stuff that is done in the industry and paid for in the industry that doesn't help human beings. And, and again, I'm committed personally, and I know Bob is committed, uh, and, and a lot of the senior leaders at Geisinger to see if we can actually scale this and generalize it beyond Shangri-La. Shangri-La is how I refer to GMC Danville. What can be done there might not be as easily done in other tougher markets, including the Northeast. And we're really interested in trying to scale and generalize in tougher markets. Not, not because the people are worse, or, I mean, it's just tougher, tougher. And can you give me just an example of that 30 to 35% of stuff? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, He's got lots of them. I mean, I you got a, you got a week. You walk down the hallway and spot him. <laughs> back surgery. Let's talk about back surgery. I mean, there's a, there's an awful lot of evidence that a significant amount of back surgery that done actually produces nothing but more back surgery. And and it depends on on whether you have a group of folks seeing a patient who presents with back pain as opposed to whether you have a specific 
discipline as to whether the patient goes in one direction or another direction. So if you try to organize this where you have a physiatrist and, and also an expert back surgeon, whether it's an orthopedist or neurosurgeon, seeing a patient, you might actually be able to extract some of the stuff that doesn't work, which is, is done. So that's one example. Another example is, uh, as you guys have probably heard, biologicals are some of the most expensive parts of our, uh, of our drug uh, portfolio. And probably the best example of a very effective biological is erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is a biological that's used to treat anemia that is a consequence of either cancer and chemotherapy treatment or, um, or chronic renal disease. And we found in our own system, this is not criticizing anybody else, but we found in our own system, when we've done best practice indications for the use of erythropoietin and then how it's actually given to a patient, when we do algorithm-driven indications for erythropoietin run by farm techs, not by individual kidney doctors in their offices in our system, but run by farm techs, 20% of the patients who are getting their erythropoietin in the first place didn't need it. So you strip out 20%, you can give them iron. You know, an iron is cheaper than erythropoietin. And then you get a 10% goose uh, on, on just getting a more efficient treatment protocol for the erythropoietin so that the blood cells go up, stay up, don't bounce all around. And, and so that's it. I can go on and on. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's really a fascinating issue because most human beings don't understand. And it's not because docs are bad. It's not because we just have the wrong incentive, which is fee for service. It's a lot of stuff. And we're able to attack that because of our structure and our commitment uh, and our success operationally. We couldn't do these things if we weren't able to fail in some areas of our innovation. So there's lots of reasons why we can do this. We just want to see if we can generalize it. And I, I think about it as what can we do within the system. We certainly can wait for reform coming out of the Beltway, inside the Beltway, or we can take steps. That going to happen. So regionally, what can health systems do? And I believe we will absolutely make big strides in bending the cost curve. And it's going to be through efforts that are organized in regional systems like ISO. And we can be a part of that. You know, take um, take the Medicare population. If you just simply look at the average annual per capita cost for a Medicare beneficiary, and you look at it by state in America, you see 40 to 50 percent variation. That's what's uh, the next step. Obviously, this variation leads to variation cost and all that excess waste, inappropriate uh, care. We will make strides in cleaning that up here within the Geisinger system using the best tools and will contribute to uh, uh, bending the cost curve right here in Pennsylvania. It's just going to happen. When you are able to deploy that kind of technology, I've never seen it not reduce variation and improve outcome. So the opportunity is staring us in the face to do what, with what we can control, and that is the care. The Health Care Act of 2009, there's a lot of resistance among some people uh, and calls for repealing, calls for defunding. How's that affecting your planning right now in terms of? Not at all. I mean, we, we, we don't, uh, regardless of what happens with ACA, uh, we still have this uh, inevitable confrontation with reality in terms of the cost trajectory, and I'm not banking on Washington with the present polarized politics solving the problem. So what we want to try to do is move ahead because of our unique structure and unique commitment to try to help solve the problem. Now just to give you some numbers that are not our numbers, they can be confirmed. We, we were part of a group demonstration project in, in, a, in, in a Medicare giving us a different way of paying for our take care of Medicare patients. And it was essentially a shared savings approach. It was called Physician Group Demonstration Project, PGP. It was five years. When you look at the cost trends for all of our care for Medicare patients in this project, you, you saw that they went from like 9% year over year increases down to 5%, down to 1.4% year over year increases. 
Now, you guys know that our Medicare population is not getting younger and healthier around here. We have some of the oldest, sickest Medicare folks in the country outside in the Deep South. The other thing, to get to your original point, was, well, will we, will we winning financially by schooling them, which was implicit in your question. Uh, it, it, I mean, now, they, could you, not would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, but the proof of the pudding is, did we school them or not? We, we hit every quality bogey, every quality bogey for the last four years of the five-year project. Every quality bogey, which we're very, very proud of. And um, so, I, you know, I think it's not either or, it's, it's both, so. Other questions from the group? Can I ask for Sure. Um, he lets me jump in once in a while. Uh, but could switch away from that for just a second uh, onto a kind of a relevant topic now. September 11th coming up, uh, tragically, one of the best examples of a mass casualty event that we'll see um, in American history. Do you think that the new arrangements between your facilities and your, your business here increases preparation, uh, planning at all for some type of mass casualty event, God forbid if it ever happened in Northeast Pennsylvania, would we see an increased level of efficiency in that type of event with these new arrangements at all? I, you know, I, I, think, I think the most concrete answer to your question would be if we were able to figure out how to run two level twos mm -hmm. <clears throat> with uh, less, uh, you know, less nervousness about a lot of the specialty trauma okay. coverage, that's really the rate limiting step. Um, you know, having the trauma surgeons available 24-7 uh, having the um, trauma neurosurgeons available, having the trauma orthopedists. Most general orthopedists or general neurosurgeons don't like, you know, to cover for that, that trauma. You've got to really get special people who are, for various reasons, turned on to it and are expert. So if we could increase the critical mass of that, that would be a very concrete, uh, positive answer to your question. The other, the other commitment that we've made, we're level one. Uh, trauma center uh, at uh, GMC. And the difference between level two and level one is level one trains. They train new emergency, new trauma people. And I would love to make these two level twos a level one so that we can get the same training capacity up here. And, and that would be an obvious, now that's a bit of a promissory note, but that's something that I'm thinking about as we, as Bob and the group sure. does the program. I mean, people generally respond to new possibilities as opposed to, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a same size pie and we're just trying to divvy up you know, who gets the bigger slice. And I mean, I think that's, I mean, we could use some of that leadership in Washington too. Other questions? I want to thank you all for coming to visit with us and sharing the information. Getting the information out to, you know, to real people is absolutely critical, so you guys are very important. And we'll ask us if you have questions or you doubt the veracity of what we've said or anything, get back to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.